Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where OP costs a scummy developer millions of dollars. Hey guys, quick disclaimer, I had a minor audio technical issue that kind of hit a couple of my videos, and this is one of those videos. So you may notice slightly lower audio quality than normal in this video, but after a couple of videos, it should go back to normal. Our next Reddit post is from Nysonaut. The setting, United States, northern neck of Virginia. The situation, I bought land and I built a house on it. Back when my wife and I were much more newlywed than we are now, we hired ourselves an architect and we went whole hog on having our cozy little dream house designed. While this was being done, we went shopping around for a parcel of land on which to have it built, which went quickly and easily, and we even got a pretty nice deal on a half acre lot that was just far enough back in the sticks for us to be happy, but also close enough to our jobs that it wasn't much of a commute. And the best part of all, no homeowners association. There weren't any HOAs in that area because, point blank, it was full of poor people back there. These were dirt poor country types and working poor wage slave types. We made very sure with our lawyer that no previous owner had ever had the title amended to allow for any HOA nonsense as well, because that's a thing that some real estate developers like to do. They'll buy up a property, get the title amended to force the membership of that property into a local HOA, which they themselves usually operate or they're in cahoots with those who do, and then resell it with that as a new requirement for any prospective buyer to automatically agree to when they sign the title. Flash forward to August of 2019. COVID was just around the corner, but nobody knew that yet. Everything was normal, and my wife and I had since moved to a different location, but we kept that property as one of our various rentals. It was our dream home for several years, and we loved that place. Moving was tough. It was a good neighborhood out there, and folks were very welcoming. Then a company that's totally not named Ryan Homes or anything even slightly similar came in and spent some years buying everything up back there and pressuring folks into selling which worked out for them only too well. And, of course, they gentrified everything. For about three years, there was massive amounts of old houses being torn down, hauled out, and new horses being built up and sold. An HOA was built right in, because of course it was. Folks who had enough money to waste on awful houses that looked nice from the front moved in one by one and two by two. Property taxes skyrocketed right along with them, and more of the less poor people were forced to sell because they got taxed out of their own homes. My wife and I knew what was coming from the get-go. We knew those dinguses from totally not Ryan Homes were going to come sniffing around our way, not to try to buy us out, but to see if they could finagle, schmooze, or threaten us into joining the HOA they were installing. It was inevitable. Lots of information is in the public record. They knew that we had money. They knew that we were living below our means by two orders of magnitude. They knew that we clearly intended to be exactly where we were, because we sure didn't have to be. They knew they didn't have a snowflake's hope in hell in pricing us out on taxes. So they tried nagging us to death and coming right up to the line of harassment, always to talk to us about joining the HOA. They failed. They got told by a very expensive lawyer to find something else to do before we got super busy helping them find things to worry about. And so they stopped for a few years. Then my wife and I moved and got the property set up as a rental. Then Ryan Holmes started bothering our tenants there, both trying to get them to pressure us into putting the property into the HOA as well as getting our tenants riled up with the most outrageous lies about what could happen if we, the owners, couldn't protect our renters better. My wife and I were livid about hearing about this nonsense. So we got a hold of Ryan Holmes to let them know that this was our formal request to stop bothering our tenants and that all further communication would be from our very expensive lawyer. They must have assumed that we were bluffing. Or maybe whoever was in charge of thinking that day didn't show up for work because they just kept right on with their nonsense. It got so bad that they were even sending fake but convincing looking envelopes with eviction notice on the front that when opened said, could be what you find in your mailbox one day without our wondrous HOA. And then containing information about the benefits of an HOA. We gathered up all the information, got the tenants to talk to our lawyer, and got the police involved to get the ball rolling on a harassment investigation. 
Another formal cease and desist letter was sent to Ryan Holmes by our very expensive lawyer, which they utterly ignored. I think their one guy who was supposed to come into work and actually think about things quit a long time ago. Maybe he never told anyone. Maybe nobody noticed. Whatever the situation on their end, when my lawyer talked to their lawyer, their lawyer told my lawyer that their client was doing everything legally, and that if we wanted to pursue this matter in court, then that's what we would have to do. So, we did. I'm not sure what kind of lawyer magic that my lawyer and his fellow legal demons worked out on this front, but we were in court for one single hour when my lawyer and their four lawyers and the judge had a private talk after the preliminary hearing. Half an hour later, the lawyers from Ryan Holmes came back into the courtroom looking like a quartet of cats who'd been pissed on. My lawyer took a seat beside me and said, they're gonna settle. And I was like, I didn't think that we were that far into this yet. What happened? He said, they built 51 homes in this county over two years. Every single one of them was inspected before close of sale by a real estate agent that never actually got around to getting her home inspector license. And that's how Ryan Holmes paid me $10,000 to not sue them. All while they got bent over by the county and the state and tag team like the new boy with the pretty lips in a prison yard. The developer got throat punched repeatedly by county and state for probably millions of dollars in fines, fees, and settlements. All because they never lawfully inspected their homes before turning them over. I got 10 grand in the settlement, which my wife and I gave to the tenants in that property because they deserved it and we really didn't need it anyways. Our next Reddit post is from Plugged In But Did. Background. I live in an apartment building with a backyard. The landlady has set up drying lines in one part of the backyard and we're free to use them. I live on the ground floor and my apartment has direct access to the backyard. I work from home, so I'm almost always here every day. Now, I have a perfect view of the lines and I can see if there are any clothes hanging on them. Sometimes, a fellow resident will hang their clothes and either forget about them or be somewhere else when it's raining. So what I usually do is bring the clothes in and leave them in the little waiting room that we have in the building where they can easily find it. It's happened enough time that everyone already knows that I'm the one doing it. A few weeks ago, one of the residents came to me and complained about how I handled their clothes. She said that I laid them down on a dirty surface or that I rumpled them too much. But they were just washed, so of course there'd be creases. She might have also insinuated that some pieces were missing. I do not cross-dress, nor do I have a fascination for other people's clothes. She ended her complaints with, I'd rather you not touch my clothes in any way. That's the first time someone's complained to me about rescuing their freshly laundered clothes. I didn't think much about it until today. A few hours ago, I saw that same lady hanging her clothes to dry. Fast forward to now, and I'm looking at them getting drenched from this awesome rain. She did tell me not to touch them. I'm currently working in front of the window so I can see when she finally takes them down. Maybe I'll give her a wave. Then OP posted an update. She finally took her clothes in some time ago, and she asked me why I didn't bring them in. I reminded her of our past conversation, and she called me something that I'm not going to repeat on YouTube. I do feel a bit sorry, because some of the clothes were apparently her work uniforms, and I know that she'll be working early tomorrow. Nah, I only feel just a bit sorry though. Then OP adds, I just received a text from our landlady asking why this neighbor is pissed at me. Apparently, the resident made a complaint, lol. I told the landlady everything, and she also called me a bad word, but in a positive sense. She said I shouldn't worry about it because it doesn't violate any of the building's rules. Well, what would that complaint even be? I told my neighbor not to do me a favor, and then they didn't do me a favor, but I actually wanted them to do me the favor, so can you evict them please? Our next Reddit post is from Artful Mortician. So, for context, I'm a 20-something British American male living in a very southern and uneducated part of the US of A. I've been here for a while now, and generally, when I tell people where I'm from, I get a little pushback because I don't really have that thick of an accent anymore. Okay, on to the story. I work in a small office, and we have a rolling line of temps that come and go. Most of them are barely high school graduates, or people with very little in the way of worldly experience. This is important for later. So one day, they bring in their usual parade of new hires and I do my introduction. Hi, I'm OP. I'm one of the recruiters here at Company X. 
I'm married with two dogs and I'm originally from the UK. Normally, this is just a throwaway line that I use as an icebreaker and it normally rolls right off. Until this one wonderful young woman pipes up. Um, you don't sound British. She, of course, left out the T very purposefully. Sorry, love, I forgot my coat and tails at home, I say. The group kind of laughed it off, and I figured it was a pretty open and shut deal. Nope. A couple of days later, word gets around that this chick has been telling a bunch of people that I'm not British and that I'm lying for clout. She said that I don't even sound British and that she's dating a British guy and she knows how they act. So, rather than be a mature adult, I do the very British thing of malicious compliance. When I need an intern to bring me some tea, would you mind climbing the apples and pears and pouring me a cup of Rosie Lee? I started wearing three-piece suits, a pocket watch, and a monocle that I found at a thrift shop. I went Super Saiyan level 3 British. Obviously, about three hours into the first day of doing this, my boss wants to know what's up. I tell her, and she finds it so hilarious that she assigns that intern to me for the rest of the day. I kept using odd British rhyming phrases and sayings, and she would have to keep asking me to speak normal. I'd reply, but I thought you know how us British people act. She quickly realized her error, and we've been cordial ever since. Nowadays, I keep my old red passport in my desk drawer, just in case someone tries to pull that stunt again. And, for the record, I'm not British, I'm English, and a scouser at that. I literally have no idea what this last sentence means. I don't know what a scouser is, and I don't know the difference between British and English. What? What is the difference? English refers to only people who are from England specifically. Thus, to be English is not to be Scottish, Welsh, or Northern Irish. British, on the other hand, refers to anything from Great Britain, meaning anyone who lives in Scotland, Wales, or England. Oh, okay, I see. What is a scouser? Because that sounds like a racial slur. It is a Liverpoolian. Down in the comments, we have this post from Roan Arc. In the early days of tech support being shifted to India, I was working at Dell headquarters in Texas. The guy who sat behind me was from London. Normally, this wasn't very noteworthy. He just had the most interesting accent on our team. But one day, he gets this lady on the line who's really upset because she called home support first and her call was sent to a call center in India. After a cross-continental and cross-departmental transfer, she's on the phone with Philip, and I hear half the conversation. Excuse me? Yes, this is Dell headquarters in Austin, Texas. Well, yes, you're correct. We're technically in Round Rock, Texas. But most people don't even know Round Rock, so I usually say that we're in Austin. Yes, I'm sorry. No, I'm being honest. I'm in Round Rock right now. You want to talk to someone who speaks English? But I'm literally an Englishman. So then he transferred her back to India. Our next Reddit post is from Azmo. When I was in grad school, I got a job at an in-department office that ordered and maintained testing supplies. I started off at the bottom of the ladder, but I was willing to learn more. By my second year in the program, I was promoted to manager and given a 75 cent raise. Woo! The work wasn't too difficult. I was responsible for taking requests from processors, getting price quotes from the companies, getting the price quotes approved, and placing orders. There were some other duties, but that was the most difficult part of my job. Occasionally, I would have to deal with our ordering department when they messed up an order. I reorganized the office in a more efficient manner and created multiple new systems for dealing with issues. I practically ran that place for several years, and it ran well most of the time. During that time, we hired a bunch of new employees. They just wanted an easy job, but my boss wouldn't take my recommendation on who to hire. In my fourth year in the program, I was asked to order some test kits by one of the program heads. The test kits were related, and I found out they could be ordered as a combo kit that would save us space, but cost a little bit more. We were low on space, so I figured it'd be worth it. I got the price quote, and I got it approved by the program head and then the department head. I placed the order. When the kits arrived, the program head was thrilled with the combined kits and thought they were fantastic. Several weeks later, my boss informed me that I shouldn't have ordered the combined kits, that they'd emptied the program's budget, and that the program head would have never approved them if she'd known. Luckily for me, I had the emails of me sending her the price quote with both price per unit and total cost and her approving them. My boss was rather stunned that the program had lied, but insisted that I take the fall for it. 
She told me that I could either take a demotion or quit. I'm pretty sure she thought that I would take the demotion, but I quit instead. The joke was on her. None of the other employees were willing to do that much, and they all refused to be trained on ordering. The joke around the office was that I had managed to burn down the office after I left. It was in complete chaos for months because my boss, who had a bunch of other responsibilities, had to figure out how to also do all the stuff that I did single-handedly. That was r slash malicious compliance, and if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.